Hello, my name is Paul Pierce. I am the church ministry representative for the Friends of Israel in the Great Pacific Northwest. It's my privilege to travel through Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Northern California teaching the biblical truths of Israel, the Jewish people historically, currently, and prophetically. But today, I have a great privilege to share with you from a portion of the Gospel of Mark, a fast-paced gospel that focuses so much on the actions and really teachable moments for Jesus' disciples. We're going to read of that here in Mark chapter 11, 15 to 26. And as I read, remember that what takes place here follows a couple of days after Jesus has come into the city of Jerusalem riding a donkey. We call it the triumphal entry, and we remember that day as we call it Palm Sunday. It's the, the day that Jesus offered himself as the Messiah of Israel. By the end of the week, he would be crucified. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. But let me read Mark chapter 11, 15 to 26. They came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and to say to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? but you have made it a robber's den. The chief priests and the scribes heard this, and they began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. When the evening came, they would go out of the city. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has, with has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you've received them and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. Well, this is an important teachable moment for the disciples with Jesus as they entered Jerusalem that day and he came up to the Temple Mount and they walked in and what did Jesus see? What did the disciples see? People sitting at tables and they're exchanging money and they're selling animals. It's Passover's coming, right? And they well, what's wrong with that? Well, there's some, everything's wrong with it. A little history of the temple is important here. When Israel was wandering in the wilderness, they had a temple on wheels, if you will. It was portable. It was called the tabernacle. And they would move around from place to place, and they would construct this. And then God's glory would dwell in the Holy of Holies, and he would meet with his people there and communicate. Solomon, David's son, would build a permanent temple for God in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount which was what we call the Temple Mount today. And in that place, it was a beautiful structure. And it stood for 374 years until Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in and sacked Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. Well, after the captivity was done, there was a man by the name of Zerubbabel and he rebuilt the temple. It was a mere shadow of Solomon's temple, but it was functional and they used it for many, many years. Fast forward to the time of Herod the great architect, and he loved to build things so people would think about him. So he built this temple, not to the glory of God, but to the glory of himself. But it was magnificent. It was huge, and it was very ornate and beautiful. In fact, when people travel to Jerusalem, first thing they see is the temple. So if Israel, if Jerusalem was important to Israel, and it is, the temple was more so. It was the spiritual center of Israel. And people would travel from all over Israel for Passover, for the Day of Atonement. It was a place where all the sacrifices were made for the sins of the people year after year after year after year. It's an important place for them. But the significance of the temple is found in this way. Jesus, you heard what he said in the text. He said, my house my father's house is to be a house of prayer, and you made it into a, a den of thieves. Well, Isaiah 56 verse 7 says this, Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. 
For my house, God says, will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. That's important to know. This was a very specific place that God said you will build, a place for his dwelling. God would dwell there among his people, but it would be a house of prayer. When Solomon dedicated the first temple, it's recorded in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 27 to 30, Solomon's saying, here are prayers, O people, the prayers of your servant and your people. It would be a house of prayer. It would be a place where God would dwell. But it was a place that people would gather around to worship God. So th this is an important place. It was a place of worship, a place of God's dwelling, a place of prayer. And Jesus says, you turned this into a den of thieves. So what did he mean by that? Why was Jesus so upset that he created such a ruckus? And imagine the disciples whose wide, her eyes were probably wide open watching this. Well, you see, this in that day, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, had to pay a temple tax. Now, they would get paid in money, but they couldn't use common coins to pay a temple tax. The money that you used to buy animals and food and houses was common. You needed a special money for the temple tax. So you'd go to the temple, and you'd bring in your money, and you'd exchange it. Well, that's not a bad idea, but let us let me illustrate it this way. This is how they were cheating people. Let's say you have a dollar bill. And you need that dollar bill turned into quarters so that you can uh, play a, a game or maybe use the showers at a campground. And you ask for help. You say, does anybody have quarters? And you have your dollar. You say, I got quarters. So you hand them the dollar bill and they give you two quarters back. And you're going, what? No, no, I gave you a dollar. Give me four quarters back. And they would say, oh, no, I'm giving you 50 cents. I'm keeping 50 cents. So that's what was happening in Jerusalem, in the temple. The money changers, if you brought in all of your Roman coins, were stamped with the image of the emperor or, the, or your Israeli denarii and all of that, or shekels, and you come in and you say, here's $20 worth of coins, and they were to take that money and they'd give you $10 worth of temple money back. And you'd go, oh, wait a minute, I gave you $20 worth. And they say, no, sorry, you get 10 back they would keep the other 10, and the religious leaders were getting very wealthy off of the people of Israel. Not only that, but the doves that are mentioned in the text, this was for poor people and their sacrifices, who couldn't afford lambs. And so the people would come in, and the poor people would give enough money to buy doves and such, and they would be overcharged, and they were taking advantage of the poor people. So Jesus said, he turned the tables over and the people scattered and the money scattered everywhere. He says, you've turned my father's house, a house of prayer, to a den of robbers. Well, it's a good application point for us here, even with the part of the, the fig tree. Jesus was looking for faith amongst people, people who are willing to believe God and obey God and have real faith. And it would be exercised in how they lived. You see, by the end of the week, Jesus would be nailed to a cross and die for our sins, according to the will of God for us. God so loved the world, he sent his only son to die for us. Even though we're still sinners, Christ died for us. He would die for the sins of the whole world. In the book of Hebrews, we're reminded that what the blood and the sacrifice of animals that were sacrificed year after year could never do and accomplish. They could never forgive us for our sins. Jesus, once for all sacrifice for us, accomplished what the blood of animals could never do, forgiveness of sins. So when we think about this, we think about the fact that when we acknowledge that we're sinners, that we can't work our way to heaven, we can't do anything to impress God. We're sinful people. When we acknowledge that and say, yes, I know I'm a sinner, I believe Jesus the sinless lamb of God, the Passover lamb, died in my place, and I now place my trust in Christ alone and what he did for my salvation. A wonderful thing happens right then. At that moment in time, the Spirit of God comes to dwell in our hearts and take up residence. He lives in us. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 reminds us we are temples of God. You see, Paul would write to Timothy and remind him that we 
need to be holy uh, vessels of honor for God's purposes. We need to be temples that are holy for God to use for his glory. And sometimes when we allow sin to go on in our life and unconfessed sin, you know, maybe Jesus needs to come in and turn some tables over in our life and say, you know what? You're supposed to be a holy temple of God for his purpose. You need to deal with these things in your life. Get them out of your life. Christ died for our sins. What kind of a temple are you today? What is Jesus saying? Hmm, you need to deal with this. I pray that as you read this text, you'll be reminded you are a holy temple for God's purposes. Have a great day.